Hey poets, hello. Welcome to Claire's Poetry Circle. I'm Claire Pollard, a poet, and I'm running this weekly workshop for beginners during the autumn. Do join us. If you haven't watched the previous workshops, you can pick up at any point and um, all the workshops are still up for you to explore. Um, if you'd like to share your work, do so in the YouTube comments or at the hashtag Claire's Poetry Circle. And I try to look and comment on as many poems as I can. Okay, we're getting near the end of our course now and I thought this week I ought to look at something a bit more technical. I'm not planning to cover metre in this course as um, I just can't do it in 10 minutes without a whiteboard. And also I think it's a bit intimidating um, for beginners. But a few of you have asked about where to put your line breaks and knowing where to put them is I think one of the main technical challenges you have as a poet, whatever level you, you're at. So I thought we'd look at them in a bit more depth today. So to begin, lines are the way we um, divide our poems. So they're a group of words that end for a reason other than the right hand margin. The line break was actually known in Latin as the versus, which is where verse as the name for poetry comes from. So line breaks could be seen as one of poetry's most defining features, the thing that sets it apart from prose. We'll just forget prose poems exist for today. That's probably easiest. But knowing where to put your line breaks can be difficult when you're starting out because there's so many factors to take into consideration. And um, where you put them really depends on what sort of poet you are and it can take a while to work that out. Um, but I've divided, I've divided it into four categories for you, four rough categories. Um, historically, I think writers decide where to put them depending on how they think of the line. And the first way they think of the line is one, as a metrical or syllabic unit. In Shakespeare is the most obvious example. The line generally consists of five iams. So an iam is an unstressed syllable, then a stressed syllable, and he puts five of them together. Ti tum, ti tum, ti tum, ti tum, ti tum. You'd find that in most traditional sonnets. You'd find that in Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Beloved, my beloved, when I think that thou wast in the world a year ago. Line breaks can also be decided on the basis of stresses alone. So each line, for example, a poet might say, is going to have five stresses in it. I can have as many syllables as I want, but I'm always going to have five stresses. That's called sprung rhythm. It's incredibly complicated. And unless you're studying Gerald Manley Hopkins, I'd probably stay out of that one. But it does exist. Also, some poets just count the syllables. The anglicised version of the haiku does this, doesn't it? Um, we usually render a haiku in English as five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. The first line five, the second seven, the third five. And there's also a thing called syllabics where people build up more complex syllabic patterns. Um, they might have the first line 12 syllables, the second three, the third five syllables. Marianne Moore does that kind of thing. You can create beautiful visual patterns doing that, although I don't think in English you really hear syllabics. Um, so that's the first way of looking at the line, is a metrical or syllabic unit. And it, with each line in that case, you'd know where to put the line break because you're following the form. The line can also be thought of as number two, a unit of grammar. So another way to decide where to put your line breaks might be to follow the patterns of conventional grammar. And you could do this yourself if you're struggling with line breaks when you're starting out. Put one where there's a comma. You take a breath anyway. It's a natural place to break it. Put a line break where there's a full stop. So then each line is a coherent syntactical unit. Poems that end their lines with full stops particularly though, are quite interesting. They're often referred to as end stopped. Ted Hughes does that a lot in Crow, and you end up with this list of ominous statements, each line kind of ending with the clang of a full stop. In Staying Human, um, this great anthology by Bloodax I mentioned a few weeks ago, um, I was reading it this morning and I, I read a poem I hadn't read before by a poet called Evie Shockley called Supply and Demand, and she uses um, its end stopped. Each line is a kind of statement, so it has a kind of flatness because it's end stopped statement about money or a cliche about money but she substitutes the word money for the word black boys so the more black boys you have the more you want full stop new line you act like we're swimming in black boys full stop new line 
Your black boys are all tied up in property, lower down, full stop, new line. Black boys won't solve all your problems, full stop, new line. And so on. I think it's a really powerful poem. It's a really powerful device. It can be a really powerful device. I have no luck with mascara. My mum tells me to wear mascara for these videos, but it always seems to come off on my face. Okay, the line can also be thought of as number three, a unit of breath. So, this was the beat poet Allen Ginsberg's big idea. He was influenced by jazz and he said that each of his poems was a single breath unit. He said, my breath is long, that's the measure. One physical, mental inspiration of thought contained in the elastic of a breath. And his first lines are a great example of that. Um, like his poem, A Supermarket in California. What thoughts I have of you tonight, Walt Whitman, for I walk down the side streets under the trees with a headache, self-conscious, looking at the full moon. <sighs> you know, you can just about fit it in in a breath. Um, in this anthology, there's a poem by the poet Chen Chen, who a poet I really like, called Poem in Noisy Mouthfuls, that has long lines. And I think he's playing with that idea too. Each line as a noisy mouthful of breath. I don't quite have Ginsberg's lung capacity, but I tend to come closest to this idea, I think. I see line breaks as part of the music of my poetry and the place where I take a breath. Um, when I read, you can hear my line breaks. Finally, the line can be thought of as, um, still playing with my mascara, a unit of meaning. So William Carlos Williams in his famous poem, this is just to say, which you might know, or you might recognise as an internet meme, the poem about the plums, would be a good example of this. It's got very short lines and they're clearly not units of breath or we'd be hyperventilating. This is a poem I often take the line breaks out of and I get my students, especially school students, to put them back in. Because without line breaks, it just reads like a note on the fridge and it's the line breaks that make it a poem. So they kind of break this poem down into these units of revelation, each one changing the meaning of the poem. I'm going to try and read it now uh, and I'll read the line breaks. I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox. It's time to break their pretension. And which you were probably saving for breakfast and so on saving on its own on the line there. So it's almost like the speaker's just realising the import of what they've done as they're articulating it. It's very clever. I'll stop there, but Google it. Um, it's a classic poem that I think uses the line as a unit of meaning. Um, poems that use the line as a unit of meaning also often kind of separate out each image. So each line has a clear image on it. Pablo Neruda does that, I would argue, in his kind of skinny odes. Uh, it allows each image the kind of space to unfurl before you move on to the next one. Okay, got all that? Now, if your poem is not end stop, there's one other thing you need to think about. I know it's a lot, but there's one other thing, which is called enjambement or running on. And that's when a sentence or a clause is broken in the middle by a line break. The term's directly borrowed from the French enjambement, which means straddling or bestriding. And it can create this sense of fluency or momentum. So if I go, I went to the shops and then I went to the cinema and then I went to the, you know, it kind of forces you to read on. It can create a kind of tumbling movement. Um, but enjambement can also emphasise words. So where you break it, the, the last word in the line, in English, that's often considered a strong point of the line. And you might put important words at the end of your lines in English for emphasis. I'm told in America, poets often see the beginning of the line as a similarly strong point um, that has a certain weight to it, which is interesting. Um, makes you read American poets differently, I think. And jumblement can also create particular effects in a really kind of obvious tacky way. If you said, I fall, and you had a line break down on the new line, that kind of, the line break echoes the fall. Um, it's like a little special effect and poets love playing with that kind of thing. So talking of which, now I'd like you to try a little exercise. Um, you, you can pause the screen in a second and write down, just in prose first of all, um, a line or two about an accident you recently had. It could be spillage, knocked over a cup of tea, a breakage. And then I want you to try and put line breaks in it to in some way create some special effects and mimic the accident. You're marrying form and content. 
Okay, and now we're back. And finally, a word about stanzas. So a stanza, uh, or a verse, some people call them, is a group of lines within a poem. I know you know that, but here you go. Um, and the blank line between the verses is called the stanza break. Stanza actually means um, chamber in Italian or room. I love that idea. I love the idea of um, stanzas as kind of little rooms within your poem. And poets often use them kind of like you'd use paragraphs as a prose writer. New topic, new stanza. Change of scene, new stanza. Um, now, something, if you want to play with form and you're starting out, the easiest way to play with form might be to decide you're going to have all the stanzas in your poem the same length. You might think, I'm just going to try to make all the verses four lines long or two lines long or six lines long. Um, and that can be quite fun just to give yourself a kind of basic but interesting kind of restraint. Um, and it forces you to change things around and make your poem kind of fit that form. So I think playing around with stanza break can be a really easy way to get into form when you're starting out. All your stanzas don't need to be the same length though. You can have a two line one, a four line one, and then a six line one, that's fine. But I would say if you set up a pattern, like of three line stanzas, and then one of them in the middle of the poem is four, that can look a bit lazy or a bit sloppy. So if you are setting up a pattern, only break it if it's for a reason, okay? But otherwise, um, you know, have your stanzas whatever length you want. No skin off my back. Anyway, there are um, names for stanzas of certain lengths you might want to know. Two line stanzas are called couplets, uh, three line stanzas are tercets, four line stanzas are quatrains. And stanza breaks, I should also say, are obviously a kind of stronger version of the line break. It's a bigger break for the eye and the ear. They allow more silence, more space into your poem. So if you're going to do those special effects, I fall down. Obviously, if you do that over a stanza break, remember that that's a bigger effect than over a line break. Right, that's a lot of info, but I'm going to set an exercise now. And I wanted to set something that allows you to play around a bit with very short lines and very long lines. So this is the exercise. Um, I want you to think about scales this week and about something either growing or shrinking. It could be something growing in your garden, a person growing, um, a housing development or a block of flats going up. It could be like a shopping list like that game. I went to market and I bought etc etc where the list gets longer and longer each time. Um, it could equally be about something shrinking. So um, lockdown shrunk many of our lives to, you know, this room, this screen, or it could be uh, about um, a feeling that's diminished over time, fear or shyness or something. Uh, it could be something surreal. It could be about the incredible shrinking husband or um, the day your dog became a monster and took over the city. <laughs> um, I don't know where I got that from. But whatever your topic, I'd like you to play with line lengths to echo the growing and shrinking. So um, your poem might become very short with one syllable line or one word line and get longer and longer or vice versa. I hope that sounds fun and I'll see you next week um, for the final workshop of uh, this term before I take a break for Christmas. Um, so I guess the Christmas special. See you then.